Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello team, welcome to Scream Something, Volume 20. My name is Emily and I'm here with my co-host, Producer Neil. Hey everybody, in Scream Something, Emily and I will be sharing our initial thoughts and reactions for the episodes of Season 4 that were released the last two Thursdays. There will be plenty of Aster in these episodes, but our team will be saving our deeper analysis for the full episode breakdowns we have planned for after the season finale. Sveka, Megan! And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The titles for this week's episodes are... Ego and Super Ego, and Zenith and Abyss. The release dates were May 19th and May 26th of 2022. The in-episode dates were September 9th through 11th and then 13th. Uh, the directors were Vinton Hoik and Christina Soda, and the writers were Michael Vogel and Akira Mark Fujita. Just in time for your next mission. Episode 23 opens with a Metatine being saved from an angry mob by King Brion and the Infinitors. <laughs> Though it seems one of the other Infinitors may actually be part of the anti-meta violence. We'll hear more about that later. After the credits, we cut to Ivy Town University, where Harper Rowe is helping Violet Harper uh, move into their new dorm room, and Harper admits that she has feelings for Halo. And then over in the Phantom Zone, Phantom Girl explains to Connor how the two of them ended up in the zone, but Superboy refuses to leave with her. Back in Markovia, Brion welcomes Lizard Johnny, the metatine from the opening sequence, to the country, which has been acting as a metahuman safe haven, but we see that Ambassador Bazovi is still pulling the strings on much of Brion's decision-making. At a group meeting in Taos, Violet talks about their complicated feelings surrounding Harper's admission and their breakup with Brion, and the other teens encourage them to reach out to Brion to get closure before making a decision. And in Metropolis, because <laughs> we're going everywhere, uh -huh. the original team tracks down the demolished magic school bus, and Zatanna summons the Trogawogs, who we've seen previously, to reassemble it. Back in Taos, the group therapy with Black Canary continues with Garfield talking about his recovery process and introducing the group to his new emotional support dog, Wingman. And in the Phantom Zone, Connor informs Zod and Ursa that Phantom Girl is definitely <laughs> awake, forcing her to flee the zone without Superboy and return to Mars, where she discovers her arm is badly burned from the lava. Later in Markovia, Halo arrives in Brion's throne room, and they have an emotional, co emotional conversation that actually seems to be making some progress towards reconciliation, until they're interrupted by Ambassador Bazovi, and everything goes off the rails, resulting in Violet storming out via boom tube. Later, Fury, one of the Infinitors, who's started to suspect that Bazovi and the Infinitors may have ulterior motives, approaches Brion with her concerns. In Ivy Town, Violet calls Harper, and in Metropolis, the magic school bus is fixed, and Zatanna uses her magical focus to get everybody to the Phantom Zone. Everything happens all at once. So much. But wait, there's more! <laughs> Because episode 24 opens on Oa, where Lorzad learns that the Kaiser Thrall is on its way back to Earth. Green Lantern Forager escorts the Kaiser Thrall to the Watchtower, where Miss Martian is called to communicate with the human brain trapped within the Apocalyptan tech. And apparently, his name is Danny Chase, and he's a metahuman child with telekinesis and multidimensional powers that are slowly killing him. I'm sure this will be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. However, this discovery is quickly overshadowed by Prince Jem calling for Mars to inform McGann that her fiance isn't actually dead. <laughs> After traveling to the Watchtower, Phantom Girl explains what she knows, and the group starts trying to come up with a plan to get Connor back. <laughs> but Phantom Girl's attempt to phase herself and McGann directly there fails. Back to the drawing board. And in the Phantom Zone, the team actually locates Superboy, but their rescue mission is interrupted by the House of Zod cornering them. And when the team refuses to release the other Kryptonians from the zone, a fight breaks out and the team is 
very much defeated. Back on the Watchtower, Danny Chase offers to link with a mother box provided by Orion and use his multidimensional powers to open a boom tube to the Phantom Zone. As a precaution, they decide to enact this plan on Trombus, a planet with a red sun, to prevent any Kryptonian criminals who might escape with Connor from being too powerful to defeat. Before this new crew of McGann, several leaguers and a handful of helpful supporting characters can head out, though, Phantom Girl gets a call on her legionnaire ring from Chameleon Boy. And unaware that it is actually McComb in disguise, Phantom Girl explains the entire rescue plan to the bad guys who promise to meet them there. In the Phantom Zone, the team escapes from the House of Zod to regroup and come up with a new plan. Meanwhile, the third prong of this rescue mission arrives on Trombus and successfully opens a boom tube. But before they can enter and talk with Connor, Lorzod arrives and Macom turns the Kaiser Thrall's powers against our heroes. When the boom tube opens within the zone, Zod takes Ursa and Superboy with him to see what's on the other side. And the team, unaware of who opened the portal and why, resolves to close it before any more Kryptonians can escape. Now on Trombus, Connor passes out from his many grievous wounds, and Lorzod announces that the galaxy now belongs to Zod. Screaming forever into the void. Wee! <laughs> so let's get into Smaster. Superboy, are you alright? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. That's a great first note you have. <laughs> so, there's a lot going on in these two episodes. Like, there are scenes i feel like i completely brushed over in writing oh, yeah. this outline because i was just like there's too much happening and we only have an hour and we have to cover both of these so i don't know where to start with that i have a lot of thoughts all across the board on this one well so my thought would be like what what's your take on like some of the markovian stuff because as of like you know as of these two episodes that hasn't come up again really so that i mean we can we can focus there just because then we can, i feel like we can move forward but my i mean so i'll start with my first thought go for it i mean i kind of felt bad for brion before but man this sucks like i i mean i, I just hate bazovi i mean not that i was a huge fan <laughs> but wow yeah that's it's it's interesting to feel like that power comes across darker and more sinister, more evil than some of the more overt ones, just because of what you're what you're really doing to that yeah. person. Yeah. Um, it, it makes me think of um, Queen Bee as well. Like that that manipulation just feels so much worse in a way because you can also see Brion genuinely wants to do the right thing. Yeah. And obviously that that makes it hit harder where it's just like, oh, no, so close. Oh, no, never mind. Yep. I agree on all of that. I feel like some of the Markovia stuff is interesting and sets up an interesting larger political landscape for everything that's going on. And I have some stuff that I'll actually probably want to put in crashing the mode about it. But yeah, it does feel a little a little odd just because in the midst of all this, because I feel like. Going into these last couple of episodes, audience is like, where's Connor? Can we get, can we, I'm very, like, being very tense about that major plot line. And then this episode, we spend a, a lot of time on something else that is super, that is interesting in its own right and very cool and very interesting in the scope of the world. But it, I almost feel like I'm like, I wish we'd seen this. 10 episodes earlier when I wasn't so, mm. so tense about yeah. everything happening in the fashion zone. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, no, I have some crashing the mode thoughts on that. I also love the, hey, you're not answering my phone calls and text messages. I'm going to boom tube into your throne room. I mean, so. Hello, I'm here now. We're talking. So on, on the level of. I get it. Sometimes it's like, I just need to be direct about this thing. But also, it's amusing to me that if you look at both of their phones, there, it was an hour. <laughs> it was one hour between Halo sending that text message and when they show up in Brion's throne room. Because <laughs> above, Definitely if I'm remembering had, had correctly, oh, above the message when Brion is looking at his phone, it says like, sent 59 minutes ago or something like that and i was like it's 
been one hour. <laughs> well, I hope there's some time. I hope there's some time zone stuff going on. If someone hadn't responded to one of my texts in an hour, I don't think I would. I would just like drive to their house and be like, so you didn't respond to my text. <laughs> but things are high tension and a lot's going on. So, you know, I'll forgive Halo. They're going through a lot right now. Speaking of Halo, because we're jumping around a bit on this, I have a note here in all caps that says Halo's new costume is everything I wanted their costume to be last season, and I'm so happy about it. It looks so cool. I like the redesign of it, as I literally, I made, I remember I made a comment way back in last season, Scream Somethings, about, like, I wished that their costume had, like, more of, like, a tunic cut instead of being just like the skin tight mm, yeah. uh s- classic kind of superhero skin tight spandex look i was like i wish they were more in line with like these specific these other superheroes who have something more something a little different something a little more loose fitting and seeing that that's what their costume is now this season i was just like yay i like it <laughs> it has sprung fully yeah, formed into I this world it. Uh, it's cool. And it's got the cool little, like, the, the rainbow stripes on it now and stuff. I'm like, that's fun. I like this one. Um, and the fact that they put Bazovi in check with a really strong se- they was also really nice. Yes. Man, oh, that's, that scene was tough. That scene was tough, though. It was a tough scene. Because I'm just like, he's so close. No, Bazovi came in. You don't like him. And I personally, I think, I read that as I feel like Bazovi was waiting because if you were genuinely worried about like oh a weird noise Ooh. just came from the throne room people would have run in the second that the boom tube went off the fact that they don't I'm like uh, you're telling yeah. me a giant explosion noise just came from the throne room of this yeah. uh this this king and security didn't immediately run in no it's fine Bazovi I think Bazovi was waiting so that you oh, yeah. have the most impact and mess with everybody. But that's just my thought. So what else do we have from this for, from Markovia? I have I have the note that while I was wa- when I watched this the first time through when there is that uh video that in-universe video explaining like here's what Markovia does to help metahumans and the infinidors and everything. I was like this animation style is extremely familiar, but I cannot place it. Like, it was not as immediate as the Teen Titans Go one for me until later hearing uh, Greg Weissman and Brandon Vietti talking about it on Twitter. And they're like, oh, this is a Batman the Brave and the Bold reference. I was like, of course it was. I can't, but it's, I haven't watched Brave and the Bold in so many years. I was like, it had slipped my mind. Like, oh yeah, no, that's exactly what that looks like. Uh, And that's very fun. Yeah, I love those opportunities to like, have it feel different but also the idea of just like yeah i guess what would an animated version of an advertisement look like (laughs) in an animated world and so you choose another animation style and that's the answer because conceptually like from their perspective you know you're thinking of like the in-world perspective of like i'm watching an animated promotional material so it looks different like oh okay i get it but yeah then that intros (laughs) also it's 95 percent effective i'm just like Okay. What happens to the other five percent? Yeah, they died. Uh, let's be honest with each other. We know what happened. Um, also, I will say this just because it will raise the ire of of some. But I do genuinely ask this question as much as I've trolled the idea of Jace not being as bad as she appears. I do genuinely wonder where the line stops between what her own bad ideas are and bad ideas that are given to her and forced upon her with as much as happens with Bazovi and and everything else. I'm not saying she's a good person. I'm just saying they're making her a much worse person. What I'll say is that it appears to me, at least, that Bazovi's powers are kind of like a short distance, immediate action kind of thing a lot of the time like so all the stuff jays did last season far away from that influence i think is all on her (laughs) you still have you still have the brain and ultra humanite those are that's my and you just bring basovi in at pivotal moments i look i just admitted she's not a good person i'm just saying that i think she's being forced into being a much worse person okay 
And on that note, um, yeah, some of the so some of the people well, we'll do the deeper dive, but like the Invenidors are will be an interesting deeper dive on like some of their comic history. But I'll leave that there. I'm sure. I will say though, a couple of them, Cobalt at least, we have seen before, but as an unnamed metatine in like larger shots of kids who were like captured or kidnapped or whatever was there blue skin white hair the hat uh, and seeing that people being like wait a second it's the same vibe as like how uh stephanie brown is in one scene in season two as never named on screen only named in the credits and then we see her later as spoiler similar vibe no wasted characters Kobold, Kobold? like the small, yeah, so like the small monster in Dungeons and Dragons. So K O B O L D. Okay, I'll s- I will say it again if you want to correct. Do we want to leave you correcting no, 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 no. me or? Oh no, no, I don't because just until today, I one hundred percent thought it was Kobold, and I'm like, I can't find this on the internet. And then I was like, Oh, I'm doing this wrong. I see what I I see what I did. Okay, I saw. I will. I will entirely admit. I saw it in the uh, the the like closed captioning and went. That's a D and D monster. There's no way that's actually his name. Uh, but apparently, I'm wrong. I was like Cobalt, you know, like blue because he's blue. No, okay, uh, <laughs> okay, Cobalt. Got it. <laughs> we will absolutely be be doing uh full deep dives into all of them. <laughs> When we do deep dives into everything, I'm sure. Yes. Well, so I'm trying to see if I have any more notes about Markovia before I jump to the 10 million other things that happen in these episodes. I don't think I do. Do you have anything more to say about? I do not. Okay. So some random thing before before we get into everything happening in the Phantom Zone. Here's some episode 23 thoughts. I have a question for you. Uh, and if you don't have an answer, we can completely cut it. Harper says that she's going to be working at the Happy Harbor DWP. And my brain is like, this is presumably some sort of like public works job or something. But I have no idea what this acronym stands for. Department of Water and Power. Okay. I've never heard that one before. Yeah, it it's in a there's one in LA, um, a, a DWP. Um, so it, it all depends because like it's a like a one off. It's like what did they decide to call themselves? Because like you have like SoCal Edison for here for me for my electricity, but then you also yeah. have like PG and E just down the road. It's literally just like what company decided what they felt like they should be called. But yeah, it is Public Works. Yeah. So she is working for Happy Harbor. Okay. Dep- my assumption that is that is my closest assumption is that it is the Department of Water and Power. Yeah. No, I am. I'm out here on the East Coast, and I'm so much more used to. People, companies just having various different names. I'm like, I have never heard this acronym before. <laughs> it might, it might be in LA, thing. <laughs> but I'm like, I've just never, I've just never heard it called the Department of Water and Power. Nope, I did not know until I looked it up either because I it just didn't make sense. But then it started to make more sense when once I started thinking like, yeah, apparently, despite being public works, they just have random names that someone arbitrarily decided is the right call for their business. Well, okay. Do with that what you will. It's one of my sillier observations for this episode. <laughs> Random other things before we get into what else do I have? I, lo- I love Wingman. I love Wingman, the emotional support corgi. He's the best boy and he deserves all the head pats. Uh, he's a good boy. Uh, I like I like this corgi. <laughs> you do know that that is also the name of Greg Sipes' dog as well. Is it? Really? Yeah. Oh, that's that's amazing. The show has done that before. Yeah, the voice the voice actor of Beast Boy, um, for obviously for the you know these newer seasons of Young Justice as well as Teen Titans and and many other properties, um, his dog sorry is named Wingman as well. Love that. I mean, Young Justice does have a history of that. Uh, for those who might not know or remember. Artemis's dog, Artemis and Wally's dog from season three into season four is named Bruce Lee. Uh, and that's because Stephanie Lemlin also has a dog named Bruce Lee. Mm-hmm. Uh, amazing. <laughs> conservation of character, conservation of DC characters does not extend to dogs yes. who are seemingly 
<laughs> exclusively named after real life dogs owned by voice actors. Yep. <laughs> okay. What else? Random other things from that. Yeah. No, Corgi is good. Corgi is good because Corgi is cute, but uh, also lovely just to see Beast Boy continuing his journey and getting better and all of that. Wonderful. So in the saga that was fixing the magic school bus, I think it's very funny that Zatanna makes the comment where she's like, you did almost as well as my students. And I'm like, Zatanna, your students destroyed like half a city block in the middle of Manhattan, like broke several things. And you're telling me the OG team who took each one of these things down without like anything getting out of place did almost as well as your students. You don't need to lie. Close. Your students are chaos. It's okay. <laughs> uh, and on that note, uh, Chicken Wizzy Trog is best Trog. That's what I say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's like, I won't do it. I know that you wanted to give me that really nice suburban looking thing over there, but frozen or freeze dried Chicken Wizzies. All right. I'm in. <laughs> also, the entrance to the scrapyard. Very epic. Like, Arr! We skirted in. Oh, team exiting the vehicle. <laughs> Hardcore music. There's a crushed bus. I'm like, oh, okay. Yes, we're going to find it. And then just calmly searching. Her. Oh, we found it. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's great. Broken. I love it. I also, with all of that, uh, <laughs> Nightwing getting annoyed and being like, why are we getting rid of my snacks in my car? <laughs> I'm not Bruce <laughs> yeah. Wayne. Like, yeah, but. <laughs> It's great. So all of which leads us to a couple of notes on the Phantom Zone from this episode, and then we'll get into episode 24. My two main things with the Phantom Zone are one, Superboy definitely reacts to hearing Miss Martian's name in episode 23, and I stand by that, and I just want to point it out. He, It's very interesting to see how, over the episodes, they explained and explored what Superboy does and doesn't remember and what does and doesn't trigger things. And it's cool to see. I just wanted to point out because it's one of the subtler ones. He doesn't say anything, but they clearly took the time to do that thing that they've done a couple of times this season. That's just having people facial expression <laughs> to be like, something has clicked. We don't know what, but <laughs> this has triggered something. Well, I also like, you know, bringing up the Phantom Zone in the bus. I I guess I just kind of thought the whole bus was going to go there. Like, mer, mer. Uh, <laughs> I think I kind of did, I guess that would have been too. way too... That would have been probably too much Magic School Bus feel to it. But um, yeah, I just, that's just kind of how I saw that going. And that's definitely not how it went. Like, I have personally been joking perpetually that I was like, I just want the whole team in the Magic School Bus to drive up to Happy Harbor and just honk the horn outside McGann's house and be like, get in, losers, we're saving Connor. No explanation. Uh, so, yeah, I hear you. But also, I understand that, yeah, driving a whole Magic School Bus into the Phantom Zone might have seemed too silly. <laughs> My... Other uh, Phantom Zone note for this, we have in this episode, we have Phantom Girl leaving the Phantom Zone uh, and watching these episodes with a week between them. The thing that I kept thinking about was how smart it was to set up showing us Phantom Girl's injuries at the end of episode 23 when she gets out mm -hmm. of the Phantom Zone because it raises the stakes and tension for the next episode because it just... It tells us without any dialogue, without anybody sitting down and anybody explaining it, it shows not tells us that injuries sustained before or during the Phantom Zone don't matter inside the Phantom Zone, but they matter a whole lot once you get out. Because that just makes us uh -huh. all scared. Yep. I had been, as I, as I have said before, I've been quietly terrified about Goner's injuries for months as no one in universe says a thing about it and that episode that moment i just whole whole brain whole body was like oh no oh no now we have proof now we have proof that it's a problem and we'll get to that because now let's move on to 24 perfect well i mean if we want to talk about that for a second more that dial clicks up another notch because while rightfully absolute fantastic idea let's go to trombus there's a red sun you're like well 
<laughs> I've also now just seen that Superman immediately feels like trash when he showed up there. So then you just click, click. Uh, yeah, I can't imagine Connor's going to feel out and just be like, yeah. I mean, that's all bad. But then you also get that brief moment of like, oh, no, he doesn't want to. That's kind of nice. Oh, nope, he's still going. They're, oh, he's out now. So yeah. that one was good. So I'll say I'll say it here because uh, I've been saying it for for forever. <laughs> and I threw this in Crash in the Mode, but it's not really a Crash in the Mode. So I'll just say it here. Nobody thinks about Connor's injuries. And it's so stressful. Um, I'm like, no. And the thing the thing that completely floored me when rewatching this episode is there is a moment where McGann explicitly mentions. So you're saying that Connor's. All of these things and injured. So why the heck yeah. didn't anybody in their plan bring a healer? Nobody brought a cleric to this adventuring party, and I am scared. Yep. It's one of those things where I'm like, I get it that like the OG team does not know the state of Connor, but Phantom Girl has seen, returns, explains the situation, and McGann's group. <laughs> Does not bring a single healer. <laughs> just, uh, just, I am scared. That is my constant state. Yeah, and I had also thought, and I, I know I I saw it online and in our Discord and stuff like that, that other people had thought when they mentioned to connect the Kaiser Thrall with a mother box to potentially bring Halo. Yes, that's one of my notes. It checks a few boxes in terms of the healing and stuff like that. But at the same time, then then like a lot of boxes just get checked. But they have school. They can't be bothered with going to another planet. Because, yeah, I the thing that I wrote out about it is I'm like, the show says we need a mother box. And my brain says, oh, of course, Halo or Cyborg, our resident mother box slash father box adjacent heroes who we are thoroughly invested in. And then the show says, nope. Orion, who was a side character a couple episodes ago, who you are probably slightly less invested in just because we've had him for less time. And like, I feel like the sense was that they wanted to gather all of the supporting characters from all of the arcs and tie everything in and all of that. They wanted to do the thing that's like, all of the NPCs you met on your adventure are here to help in the final battle. And I, I get that that was the intention, but if me and so many other people immediately went, oh, yes, Halo, the person who makes the most sense for this situation, not only for Motherbox, boom tube powers, but also healing. I want like a one ex- one sentence explanation of why Halo and Cyborg were both busy. I'm like, if the show had literally just said we can't get a hold of Halo and Cyborg, they're doing X, Y, Z, I would have gone, great, Orion is the next person on that list. But it just feels to me like it wasn't the intuitive option immediately. Like, it makes sense for the idea of bringing all of the side characters together. But it doesn't make the most, like, emotional sense to me, I guess, would be the word. I'm not Mm. sure. And so it's like, it's one of those things where I'm like, I just need one more sentence. Versus my other thing. So my main note. My not even my main note, my one kind of negative thing with this episode, which is a thing that I notice with a handful of episodes this season, and it happens sometimes in season three, too, is that so I understand that in character information recaps are meant to remind the audience of important things that they might have forgotten in the week between episodes. And I understand that I may like rewatch and think too hard about what happens on Young Justice, maybe more than the average casual viewer. So maybe I notice these more. What? (laughs) Who would have guessed that doing a podcast, sometimes maybe you think about the thing more than the average. But the number of times over the past several episodes that Phantom Girl has explained nearly word for word the exact same thing on screen to different people with with no new information, (laughs) seemingly for the sake of the audience, is kind of tiring. Like, if I could, like, tweak this episode a bit, I feel like if they had cut out that 
extended flashback in 24 of her explaining like, oh, I was on Mars and I grabbed Connor and we went to the Phantoms and all of the stuff that we have seen mm. so many times is if they had cut that and just kept when McGann says, so you're telling me that Connor is alive, injured and so troubled he won't return with you. Because I feel like if you've been watching this whole season, even week to week, that's all you really need. Like, I'm like, I feel like we've been told several times how this works and I don't need to be told again to another character. Yeah. But this is me. Th- like, I feel like it's one of those things that I feel like is in telev is kind of a holdover from an era of television where episodes aired once and you had to remind the audience in case there were people who weren't caught up. Like I think back to like the age of like when Avatar the Last Airbender was on TV. Avatar the Last Airbender d- does a lot of big plot lines and bringing back characters and ongoing stuff and all that. And it has those openings that people remember that are like previously on Avatar and it will show you some clips of stuff. And in oh, our yeah. modern day, people are like, well, that seems kind of silly. Why Why you need that? Like this only happened five episodes ago. Of course I remember. And it's like, you have to remember that this show was airing in the early mid 2000s when that wasn't a thing that was super easy to do for people. Rewatching stuff was not at the same level it is now. And so it's like, yeah. I get that we needed ways to be like, oh, hey, kid, you had summer camp and missed five episodes over the past month. Here's what you missed on Avatar. And I I get that. But it's almost like at this point, I'm like, I don't need such heavy handed re-explanations of stuff just because I know it's there for the audience. I get why it's there. I'm just like, I feel like there's a, a quicker, more condensed way we could do some of these because I'm stressed and have never once forgotten what Phantom Girl had to do. Uh, my guest Phantom Girl, I know. But again, it's one of those things where I'm like, I don't know what the right, I don't know exactly what the right balance is. Cause again, I understand I have a skewed view of some of this stuff. I'm like, maybe there is someone out there who is mm. like, thank you for these recaps. I keep forgetting what Phantom Girl did. Um, but I don't know. I can only speak from my own perspective. Please go ahead and cut off my rant. No, no, no. The other thing that I, I thought was the um, potential for having the scene where that, that information is relayed, but not relaying it for us in the yeah. sense that with McGann on screen, you can do the touch the temple, flash the light, call it good. Um, that, that, that was where my head went when you started saying those things, because it still gives the viewer the idea that, oh, okay, mind link happen, information download happen, again, up to date, let's go. Yeah. Or the, like, since these episodes have so many cuts back and forth, like I was thinking, you could even just do a thing of Phantom Girl being like, so here's what happened, and we cut away to everybody else doing whatever, fighting in the Phantom Zone, whatever it may be, uh, and then we cut back and you have everybody being like, so you're telling me that one sentence summary, either any of these things, I'm like... No, it cuts back and then says, thanks for coming to my TED Talks. <laughs> oh, the number of times I genuinely say that after <laughs> after yes. very long explanations. <laughs> Let's say 31st century version of a, of a TED talk. <laughs> Just memes that would make no sense to us from the Legionnaires. Um, yes. Oh, that'd be so good. But yeah, it's it's not the worst thing that they could have done in all this. I I get it. I get why it's there. And it's one of those things that often doesn't bother me when I'm watching the first time. And then when I'm rewatching stuff to write about things, especially when I'm rewatching more than one episode back to back, it like really hits me i'm like okay wait (laughs) but not the worst thing i just wanted to say it because it's it's just a thought it was my main thing when i was rewatching that i was like eh, i don't know if that works for me but when there's so many other cool things happening in this speaking (laughs) speaking of everybody uh that whole thing on the watchtower everything on the watchtower a lighter sillier note I have a note here in all caps that just says McGann actually bothered to text the group chat because I have been joking all season that no 
Yes. I get why nobody told McGann. I get what Nightwing's argument was. I get it. I understand. And I understand that Prince Jim had more to go on and thus he he can just run to Miss Martian and be like, hey, Superboy's not dead. Why is everybody else going on some assumptions and guesses? But I think it is very funny <laughs> when you compare the way Nightwing and Zatanna were like, we're going to get everybody else besides Miss Martian involved. And Miss Martian apparently seemingly immediately was like, text the group chat, Connor isn't dead. <laughs> and that's just funny to me. <laughs> just the idea, I've, I've been joking about this idea for the whole season. Uh, and I get that this is the more serious version. She's like, well, I tried to get in contact with everybody and nobody's answering. Well, I'm like, okay. But in my mind, it's just all caps text to the group chat. <laughs> The somewhat awkward conversation with Jim of just like, yes, I believe that she's telling the truth. Okay, I'm going to start. No, no, wait. I believe that she believes <laughs> she's telling the truth. Okay. Okay, go ahead. No, no, never mind. I'll make a mind link. Okay. Thank you. Big fan. Yeah, no, I did like that. I like I like a little bit of that. We've established before that Prince Jim is a little, a little awkward and it's fun. Yep. Uh, I also other random little things I like. I do like the detail of McGann and Orion both checking in with Danny and Motherbox respectively uh, before being like, are you sure you're OK with this? And realizing like the second time through, I was like, oh, they're each talking to a different person in this equation. Uh, that's nice. That's a It's a good little yep. touch. I like how when the team shows up, they start doing more of that thing that we talked a little bit about of like the physical and emotional parallels that trigger Connor's memories of the team of different, th like I really love the one that's Calder stepping in front with like his hand up and being like Connor, no. And that cutting to Calder in the same pose yeah. at Cadmus. I'm like, Oh, that's so good. That one was so good. Like the other ones I'm like, these are good. These are fun. And then that one, I was like, Oh, that's perfect. And we finally get to see everybody take that photo we've been seeing all season. That was a fun touch. We'll be back in season one designs on everybody. Nice. And it also answers the question that I feel like the fandom <laughs> just asked. Like, well, then who took the picture? And then it was like, I can take the picture. You bet you can. And then, <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess that would work. Uh, telekinesis. It has, its, it has its advantages. But place. So I have a question for you. Let's, yes. Do is Danny dead? Did Danny die? I I assume so. I assume. I very much assume so. That was my first thought. Was like, whoa, you you killed Danny. Okay, but I also thought like That's there was also the half second when I very when when I first watched it where I thought. I thought like McCall was just being super over the top evil. Like he called like the move that he did. I realize he's asking, he's telling the Kaiser they're all too fractalized and, and hurt everyone. But there was a half second where I was like, I, geez. Okay, cool. You fractalized him. I didn't need to hear that. Just, <laughs> just move on. Oh, you're asking the, the Kaiser they're all to do that after you apparently killed Danny. Yeah. Same thought, same thought, had that same thing happened. Though I had a little bit of like, <laughs> it's it's the optimist in me who wants to go, no, no, da Danny will be fine. He's just incapacitated. We can fix this. It'll be fine. <laughs> like, I know it's probably mm. not fine, but I had a little bit of a moment of enough of me wanted it to not be true that I, to reference Avatar again, had that flashback to that, that line from the Ember Island players where they're like, did Danny just die? I don't know. It was really unclear. <laughs> like that was how I felt for a second. I was like, yeah, I was like, I don't, I don't know. We've only seen you as a consciousness. I don't know what this means. Uh, so who knows? I could hold yeah, out hope. Like we could fix everything. It could be fine. It probably won't be, but who knows? Uh, yeah. It's like clear. The Kaiser Thrall still works, but also that like, did you just remove the the pieces of Danny that are still there? Like, is that is but, that what you did? I don't know. It's messed up. But Whatever you did, it's messed up. Kaiser Thrall like. focusing his 
power, like utilizing his powers. So if he's not there, how does that work? I don't claim to understand apocalyptic technology. So <laughs> good call. Me either. My last couple of notes here, one more serious and one more silly, are when Zod had that line where he's talking to Connor and he says, I will assume your risk. I am your stability. I am your constant. I was just kind of internally screaming, don't you dare say you're his anchor, because we have set that up through uh, some some previous parallels of that th- as a thing with Connor and McGann. And don't you dare turn that into into a weird memory rewrite thing here. Don't don't do that to me. Not here. Not not in this house, <laughs> which just leads me to Connor. Please, please let McGann help. Please, I get it's interesting and complicated seeing how he's attached various memories and feelings to being like, I can't go back. I don't want to hurt the people that I care about and all of that complicated psychology. But I'm like, can we pull a bereft and then get you to Black Canary? This is all I want. Um, I am also my silly note, my final note for this episode. I am once again asking DC Comics to please, please make a kitten tickle plush. I just, I'm a a simple girl and the evil cat is very, very cute, especially when she's just happily purring while asleep on the, on the console of the, of the war world. It's fine. There's no reason to be nervous that Tickle's on the war world. Uh, I just think that she's adorable and we should all get to give her a little, little head pat. Please, DC. A plushie. Oh, this yeah. is my request. Nothing like an angry vandal willing to let Clarion hang out. Nothing nothing bad there. Not at all. Just extremely cat behavior of finding the most important place and taking a nap there. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. In Crashing the Mode, we will be discussing potential storylines running through our heads based on the episodes released at the time of recording. This Crashing the Mode is based on episodes 1 through 24 and the trailer, which I presume we, I think we've seen everything from at this point. Almost. No, there's a couple things we haven't seen. I'm just remembering now. But we'll see. I'm sure we'll see those in the next two episodes. Yay! (laughs) So, my random things here, throwing them out. Was Fury, the Infinitor, who has her whole little plot line about realizing maybe not all is well in Markov, in Markovia, was she actually talking to Brion at the end of that episode, do you think? Because there has been some speculation I've seen, or every man. Yeah. I also had the more chaotic theory of what if that's not Fury, what if it's every man disguised as Fury trying to get Brion's trust so we can do something even more convoluted? Who knows? There are so many different equations with that scene because we don't see where it goes from there and we don't know, quite know who yeah. was involved because there is a shape changer in Markovia. Only time will tell. I would like to set up and forecast of Brion dismissing Bazovi. To like lead to having those introspective moments and really questioning, being at a point to be willing to question and hear other questions from someone else. Yeah. But but at the same time, all of those theories, extremely valid, very plausible. My other thing about Markovia that I added to the crash in the mode while we were talking is discussing what's up with this whole little Markovia storyline. Why is it here? Why is it this part of the setup? I personally think it is mainly here because we know at least a little bit about what the plot line for the upcoming comics miniseries is going to be. And it deals with Perdita being kidnapped and a whole thing with that. And that being one of the two plot lines, because there's going to be like a flashback plot line and a current tense plot line in those comics. And we know at least one of them is about Perdita being kidnapped, which I assume is part of the reason that we are seeing more of Markovia at this point in the series, because we need to understand what the current political landscape is in this in these fictional European countries, because the comics are going to at least partially deal with some political intrigue involving Vladiva which shares a border with Markovia and apparently has its whole refugee crisis going on because of the metahumans and all of that. So I feel like I just wanted to throw that out there as part of what is probably going on with why we 
have we because we've had only we've had like a couple of references to Markovia throughout the season. And then we get this episode that's like, hey, here's what's happening in Markovia. But yeah. And the Young Justice Targets comics are coming out very soon. I think digital first. They're going to be digital first. And those are coming out at the near the end of this month. I can't remember the exact date, but it's later in June. Yeah, it's it's like a week after it's a, like a week after yes. the finale um, in terms of their digital release. But then um, a bit of a gap for their physical release in a comic store near you. Yes, your friendly local comic book store will have them in July and you should absolutely pre-order, set up a pull list, whatever you want to do. Get those comics. I'm excited for them. Crash in the mode, man. <laughs> yep. So and with all that. I think we can Zeta out of the Watchtower. Thank you for spending some time with us here today. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. And if that isn't enough for you, you can email us at WhelmedPodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star re- review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. Uh-huh. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our meet. <laughs> media at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., as we have a much harder time finding those. If you are able to support us monetarily and would like to do so, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours, under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well.